sorry. Um, okay. Okay. So, so I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody today to this webinar to introduce the whole concept of, of crowdfunding and what it could mean for rare diseases. Because I think that there's something in this whole uh, phenomena. And I hope that we'll all learn a lot today about what crowdfunding is for a start, the whole variety of possibilities that there are out there for patient organizations, and learn from a little bit of the practice as well. Um, and so I'll talk to you a little bit in a moment about our, our program. So as you can see, by the way, um, okay, so people are saying that Barry's voice is not coming through at full volume. Barry, can you just count to five for us there for a second? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, is that better? Okay, it's pretty good. Yeah, people are saying that it's 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 okay. We'll we'll, we'll work not as loud as me. Um, Barry's actually on a telephone line, um, so maybe that's maybe that's the reason. But I think it's it's pretty clear. I think we can hear it pretty clear. If if it gets beyond that, we'll 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 come up maybe with an alternative um, solution. So thanks everybody. So just, um, yes, as a housekeeping, um, uh, by the way, you can see a chat window on the side. Um, so if you have any questions, and later on we'll have, I hope, quite an active discussion session, please feel free to um, type uh, some of your questions into that chat window, and we'll put those questions to our, our panelists. So hopefully what I'd, li I'd like personally to get out of today is to learn about crowdfunding and specifically how it can be useful to rare disease patient groups. Getting into the practice, I'd like to learn what it is, what does it take to set up and manage a crowdfunding campaign? What kind of planning does it take? And what kind of time commitment does it take from us? Because as we know, many patient groups are run on a volunteer basis. As we learn later, there are hundreds of, of crowdfunding platforms out there. So we, I'd really like to learn, you know, what's the best platform or what are the best platforms that are out there? Or what are the pros and cons of the different platforms that are out there? How do you best promote your campaign? Because it is difficult once you put up a crowdfunding campaign to get it out there. I'm seeing more and more scientific-led and research projects get uh, uh, put up on crowdfunding platforms. So I'd, learned, I'd like to learn about you know, what falls best with the public. I mean, what engages best? What kind of projects work best to appeal to an audience uh, using crowdfunding? Because there's a whole variety. And then I'm sure you all will have some general um, discussions and, and, and questions. So I'd like to welcome our speakers today, who you can see in our, on, our, on our webcam. Barry James from the Social Foundation, also the Crowdfunding Center. And I'd like to thank Barry specifically for taking the time to be with us today. Um, very generous of you, Barry, and I really, really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to your talk. And then um, your artist member, chairman, and uh, founder of the UK AKU Society, Nick Ciro. Nick has an ongoing uh, AKU uh, crowdfunding campaign right now. He and his team are trying to raise almost $100,000 to contribute towards an international clinical trial that they are running. And I'm very excited to learn about the practice of how Nick came up with that concept and how they planned it and how it's going. So we'll hear from Nick uh, in just a few moments. Really how this uh, webinar came about was because Nick's group, the AKU community, and another group are one of two groups within the Rare Connect project who have actually uh, successfully launched um, crowdfunding campaigns. Nick will talk you, as I said, about you, his campaign later, the Cure Black Bone Disease, which you can just see briefly here. Um, but there's also another a group called the Lois Syndrome Community, who are a Spanish group, um, who in a very challenging time in Spain, in the economic crisis, managed to raise almost 45,000 euros um, for um, an inv a scientific investigator to fund um, a one-year position to investigate into this really, really very rare disease. And they managed to get some considerable coverage within the Spanish media, on the television, in the national newspapers, 
and really according to their team, um, due to the collaboration and the solidarity of the medical community and all of the families and patients who really pulled together to uh, support that campaign. I'd ask the, 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 this group to participate in our webinar today, but unfortunately due to a variety of other meetings they couldn't, but they've asked me to provide their details um, so that you can perhaps email them if you would wish and I'll provide those details to you um, uh, as, later on in, in the webinar. So let's, let's start. I'd like to hand over the floor to Barry James from the Social Foundation and the Crowdfunding Centre. Barry has a, a background He's an as an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur, and has really also helped a lot of startup businesses yeah, through the crisis when banks really aren't lending um, to come to terms with what is crowdfunding and how crowdfunding can help them in a commercial context. But today he's going to share some of his insights um, and his experience with us into what is crowdfunding and how it can be relevant for us. So now, Barry, have, can you now see the, the window to share your screen? I can, thank you. And Great. I'm uh, just going to pick a window and hope I get it right first time. Please bear with me if I don't, we'll get it sorted out very quickly. That looks like the right one. And I'm clicking share. Um, this looks like we're in the right area. Can everyone see the social foundation? Oops. No? Yeah. Did that work? Or do I need to share it again? Hello? Can, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I can hear you, but I can't share. I can't yet see your screen. Can you see the share your screen button? Yeah, uh, yes. Is it, uh, is it sharing now? Let me try again. It's loading. It's loading. It's loading. Yes. Excellent. We've lost you again, Barry. It's, I think it's because you're closing Chrome. Can you keep Chrome open? Can you keep that window open? Yeah, it, it's doing it automatically rather than me doing it. So let me do it one more time. Okay, I'm I'll tell you what that. then. Right. Yeah. How's that? Great. Great. If you can go full screen. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, apologies for the for the tech. Hopefully it'll be out of the way uh, any second now, and we can see. Okay. So um, so firstly, thank you for the uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, to talk to you. We're really um, I'm really excited about the possibilities of what crowdfunding can do in this scenario. Um, I got involved and interested in crowdfunding in the first place because of the capability to get new things started uh, and to fund new enterprises. And, and that's, but that's social enterprises um, as well as uh, business enterprises. Um, so uh, some time ago last year we set up the Social Foundation um, in order to work with all the crowdfunding 
crowdfunding platforms, of which there are now many in the UK, uh, to, to expand this. And we've been doing quite a lot of work uh, in Westminster with, uh, we've set up the Westminster Crowdfunding Forum, um, we're working with, uh, we've now got a, an all-party group of MPs, so we're working widely, both with MPs, uh, with government, and so on, uh, because this is a whole new economic model with, um, with, with, with huge potential to do things in a completely new way. And the great news is that um, when Dennis and I spoke um, a little while back, it was immediately obvious to me that there's, you know, there's, there's something here, there's a great fit. Um, you know, wh whereas, the, um, uh, uh, whereas the existing economic models and paradigms um, you know, are great for, for the mass market, um, there's, you know, there's, there's a capability here within crowdfunding to do something that the, the older economic models, those traditional economic models, can't do. So uh, just as I go to my next slide, uh, um, forgive me, but I, I, I just want to check I'm not speaking into the void. You can hear me, can't you? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the Crowdfunding Centre, which is at the crowdfundingcentre.com, is uh, now at the centre of all this. Um, someone mentioned before, we'll, we'll, I'll go into a bit more kind of uh, detail about uh, what crowdfunding is and how it works uh, and so on. But someone mentioned before, you know, how do you find a platform? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, n know what its specialism is, what, what's good, what's bad, and so on. Um, we've created the Crowdfunding Centre as a resource uh, to help you find the right platform. So. You, you know, you can you can go and research platforms. You can see what they do. Um, uh, you know, and, and you can compare and contrast. You can go and look for projects um, that you know that are of interest to you, and you can learn about crowdfunding. Uh, and, and that's going to be you know increasingly. Um, you know, uh, there's also a news service as well, uh, and, and that's growing by the day. So, so there's a resource there already that should help. Um, you know, you get initiated and, 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 and get started with understanding and getting your head around crowdfunding. Okay, so that's uh, the crowdfundingcentre.com. Um, coming up, um, and one of the things I'd like to talk about a bit later on, because it's an opportunity, I think, for um, patient groups, particularly in the UK, is UK Crowdfunding Day on the 1st of November, at which time we also have our crowdfunding Deep Impact Conference. Uh, it was called Deep Impact because we saw the capability of crowdfunding to do something major and new um, that uh, fixes a lot of the problems that are uh, endemic in the old system, both in terms of entrepreneurialism and getting, um, getting businesses started, but or any kind of venture. One of the great things uh, about crowdfunding is that uh, it's much easier to get something going. It's much easier to start. You don't need permission from anyone else. You don't need, uh, you know, permission from the bank, uh, a VC fund, or, or, or anyone else in order to get stuff going. So um, that's coming up on the 1st of November. Uh, I'm hoping some of uh, the folks from Eurodiz and some other organizations are going to be with us on the day. It's also crowdfunding day, so. There we go. Uh, the, the, the presentation uh, which I'm going to go through, I'm going to skip through because a lot of this was uh, not entirely relevant to you, and um, the, uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, some of the um, some of the background to it. But uh, for those of you who don't know, crowdfunding comes in three flavours. Uh, there's uh, there's what's sometimes called donation or rewards-based crowdfunding. There's equity crowdfunding. Um, equity crowdfunding is where you are effectively investing in a company. So you're, um, uh, you're investing a, a, anything from a very small amount of money from £10 upwards 
uh, to buy some shares in a company. Uh, and then there's, there's uh, crowd lending, sometimes called peer-to-peer, -peer, which is a third form of crowdfunding. Um, the, the variants which are, I believe, are kind of direct relevant to, to you and here are the re, uh, donation and rewards-based crowdfunding, crowdfunding, and probably to some extent, uh, in some cases, the equity or shares-based crowdfunding. Um, so we'll, we'll explain that a little, a little bit further as we go on. But I'd, I'd, you know, I'd like to a lot of this, you know, to be kind of based around your questions and so on. Um, that was the last Deep Impact conference. Some of the things that we've been writing on there. So as I mentioned before, uh, crowd lending, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending, um, it competes with the banks very effectively. Um, it's something that may be of interest to some people, but I, I, it's probably not um, directly applicable here. Uh, crowd investing, um, again, it's you know equity on offer. So uh, places like Crowdcube.com, um, SquareNot is a new one. Um, a, a company will go on there and will offer a portion of its shares for um, uh, for on a fixed deal. Uh, and one of the one of the the nice things about um, uh, crowd investing, equity crowdfunding, is that it's very much more in control of the people running the venture. So um, uh, that's one, one of the virtues of it. And then there's, you know, the one I think is of, uh, certainly at this stage anyway, and probably um, going forward, is crowdfunding proper, I suppose you might call it, uh, sometimes called pre-sales or rewards-based crowdfunding. Uh, and, and what you're doing there is, is, is there's a cause, an idea, um, uh, or, or whatever, and you're gathering together the community to, you know, to achieve something. Okay. Uh, these are just a few of the platforms uh, that are out there, just to give you a rough idea. Uh, Bloom VC is based in Scotland. Very good platform. It's rewards-based crowdfunding. Um, they're, you know, they're good and supportive. Uh, the one amongst many, but they're good and supportive. Uh, Banks of the Future are based in London. They, um, uh, uh, they're doing some really interesting new things. They uh, mix it up, but they're, they're more focused. They do both, but they're more, uh, all three in fact, but they do more um, work on um, the equity side than, than they do on the others. Um, Kickstarter, you may well have heard about. This is a, an American-based platform, um, and um, uh, uh, probably the best known in the world. Um, so, you know, uh, that's a, that's a non-UK one. Again, that's rewards-based. And um, Crowdcube is um, We're probably just touching on. Uh, the point down here. The, the way the crowdfunding works is that typically you will use one of these platforms, um, although actually it's possible to successfully crowdfund on your own website, a lot more effort, um, and you know, you kind of got to know what you're doing. Uh, but it, it's much easier to do it on one of these platforms. Uh, having, having got the focus for your campaign, whether it's a treatment, um, or, or, or like with um, AKU, uh, um, a program of whatever sort, um, you, you'll be making a video to explain to people very concisely, it's really important. Um, and what you need the money for, basically. That then gets uploaded to the platform, um, uh, with, with, unless it's equity, with a number of rewards, and there's a, there's a whole skill set around, and we can kind of, in the questions and answers, perhaps we can talk a bit more about the skill set. Um, Nick and AQ have come up with some really good rewards uh, uh, for, for their campaign. Um, uh, they, they, need, uh, they need to be a, a good spread. Again, we can talk a bit more about that. 
Um, so uh, once it's uploaded and you press the go button, um, it's time limited. So it's usually 30, 45, or 60 days. Sometimes it's 90 days for the campaign. It's target based, so you need to know what your target's going to be. Is it going to be 50,000 pounds, 100,000 dollars, or, or, or what the figure is? Um, and Barry. usually, not Barry? always, it's, a, it's an all or nothing. Barry, um, can I stop you for a second? Okay, I'm, I'm, Barry? is that any better? I'm, I'm going to try and speak closer to the microphone and speak up. Because what um, we could do is we could switch you to, we, we could so switch you to web audio. Uh, Indiegogo, for example, which is a, one of the bigger American-based platforms, uh, do offer an all or, all or nothing service, but they also offer um, uh, 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 you know, take what you raise service as well. They charge a little bit more for that. So if you set yourself a target of $50,000 but you only raise 30 um, under the all or nothing regime, uh, you get nothing. It, uh, the money's never collected or returned to, to sender. Um, on, under the, um, uh, uh, the Indiegogo um, Keep What You Raise scheme, you, of course, keep what you raise. Um, it, uh, most of the platforms charge, uh, the norm is about 5% of what you raise. And that's taken at source when you raise. Some, you know, examples uh, of things that have been sort of successful. Uh, it can be very simple. The Nifty Mini Drive was something that was successful on Kickstarter very early on. As you can see there, they absolutely smashed their target, and it's not at all unusual to raise more than your minimum. Um, in in this case, they were um, in this case they were were selling a product, so. You know, they uh, they sold it many many times over. It was a pre-sales model. Uh, the other one, which is now world famous, is the the Pebble Watch, who uh, wanted to create this sort of nifty um, uh, watch that works with your phone via Bluetooth. Um, and they they needed a hundred thousand uh, dollars. They ended up with ten million dollars in pre-orders. Um, so, you know. Um, that may or may not be applicable, but it could happen. Uh, the ability to go over target is so in the culture here that um, that people talk about stretch targets now. So they'll set a, an achievable target, but they'll have another target which they they really want to get to called a stretch target. Um, so that gives you an idea. Um, and uh, you know, part of the power of crowdfunding is it takes away the middlemen. So instead of having to wait for a government body or a pharmaceutical company or anyone else um, to, uh, you know, facilitate what you're doing, it allows you to harness the power of your community, to work with your community without anyone in between. Um, and it removes the guesswork, it removes the middlemen, it removes all the extraneous agendas, and it, you know you can quickly find out whether you've got a project, whether you can fund it, whether the community is there or not. Sort of counting the beans rather than guessing. Um, so um, uh, you know it, it does all those things at the same same time. I've covered most of those already. Um, Okay, uh, this is an open, it's really important, it is an opening up. L let me just move forward to some of those. I'm going to talk in a minute about how to succeed, uh, but um, l let me just kind of touch on, um, be before I do that, uh, some of the aspects that are, I believe are absolutely crucial to what you all do. In that, you all have a community. Um, and the way that, that, that crowdfunding works is it's a, ki it's a kind of community building. So 
it, it, it's a different kind of marketing. Social media, so, uh, crowdfunding is built uh, on, uh, on community and social media. So the process of um, raising a crowdfund uh, is about uh, engaging with your community. It's about getting them interested. It's about getting them on board. And, and then, uh, and if you can imagine a, a series of concentric circles, it's about you using and working with them to engage with their crowd so that you, you, you enlarge the circle. Um, so how to succeed at crowdfunding? Um, we'll move to questions and answers after this, I think, uh, if that's okay. But how to succeed at crowdfunding? The first thing is um, you need to think sort of carefully about uh, how you're presenting your, your, uh, your proposition in a way that people can understand it, in a way that people can, can engage with, uh, firstly in your com community, and then on out from there. Um, the, the second thing to think about is, um, is, is that community and particularly social media. Social media is crucial. Uh, and the joke is that, you know, if you haven't started already, start yesterday uh, in terms of building that community uh, and, um, uh, because that will be your biggest asset. So you can see crowdfunding as, you know, as a child of social media. It genuinely is a child of social media. It's the ability for a, a group of people who care about something, actually anything, but you know, this is one of the strengths where 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 you all are concerned. It's uh, you know, it's the, the ability for a group of people to come together and and not just think about something or exchange ideas, but actually do something and actually fund something. Okay, so um, you, you need to find the right platform. Um, uh, we can talk a bit about that. Uh, as I said, there's a resource there that will help you with that with the crowdfunding centre. Um, do your research, learn from other people's triumphs and disasters, key point there, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, there's a lot of things that you can learn from, come and get involved in um, crowdfunding day, we'll be having lots of case studies, lots of stuff to learn from there too. Um, we've already mentioned about building your audience, um, bring your tribe and start early, um, and we said craft your rewards carefully. Uh, and what I mean by that is you need to have something for everyone. So you need to have something that's not a lot of money. It might be a pound even or a ten pounds for people to say, do you know what, I want this to succeed. Um, uh, you need to have something in the middle at around 30 or 40 pounds. That's the average uh, reward or donation. And it may only be a poster. It may be a T-shirt. It may be a mug to say, I helped. Um, cure black bone disease or whatever that is, um, which people can you know engage with and feel good at, uh, good about. And then if you're clever and you and, and you've got supporters or celebs or, or whatever um, who will you know take someone out to dinner or take them to to one of their premieres or whatever, you know you can have that at the top end for uh, 500 or 1,000 pounds or whatever. And there are those people who you know kind of you know will. Uh, come up with those sorts of amounts of money, um, both as a um, uh, as a way of feeling involved and and, and, and meeting with celeb or whatever, uh, but also as a way of contributing and, and being involved. Um, other lessons are um, crowdfunding in many ways is is relationship building. It's marketing in the way of relationship building. So. Um, one classic mistake to avoid is I've got my I've got my um, uh, campaign loaded. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to see what what happens. It, it won't happen. It won't happen. The the first week or so of your campaign is absolutely crucial. Um, you really need to uh, be on there, making sure and, and actually talking to your friends and family and the, the other people in, in your group to make sure you're going to get over the 20, 30 percent mark, because that's a confidence booster. It's a big deal. Uh, once you're over the 20, 30 percent mark, it gives the people that aren't in your direct group, but are in your indirect groups, you know, 
your friends' crowds, the, crowd, the crowds of your crowds, the confidence to go, do you know what, people care about this, and actually this might succeed, I need to look at this and maybe I'll, maybe I'll put some money in. So, you know, don't sit back, think of it as, think of it as relationship building and marketing. Um, uh, and uh, do you know what, uh, if you don't raise the first time, learn from your mistakes and try again. It's not the end of the world. Um, because we mentioned the Pebble Watch earlier on. They ended up not with $10 million, but with $15 million after they closed of pre-orders very quickly when they started out needing $100,000. Um, what most people don't know is that uh, only a few weeks before, they tried to crowdfund uh, on another platform, Indiegogo in this case, and they failed. They failed dismally. They didn't reach their target. They didn't get the hundred thousand dollars, and they learned from that. They honed their video. They came back, and you know the result is the one I just mentioned. Okay, so um, I, I uh, I'm going to stop there if that's okay. Um, except to say, there's great potential here because. Of the um, uh, because of the the model and the capability to um, uh, uh, to work with smaller groups to, to, uh, because it's community based. So I hope that's a helpful introduction. I hope it tells you some of the things that you needed to know. Um, you know, what, what, why don't we move to questions? Okay, Barry, thank you. Um, th at least I think that gave us a very good introduction to the concept. What I had planned was that we would go to some questions at the, at the very end, um, once we'd heard from Nick and heard about some of the practice. And I certainly have some questions that I want to throw in. Do you, is that okay for you for, from a timing perspective? Do you have time to stay with us for a little while? Yeah, that's fine, no problem. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Nick. Um, if you can hear me, um, can you enable your microphone and maybe we can talk about your ongoing crowdfunding campaign? Sure, it should be enabled. Can you hear? Oh, it is. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks. Great. Okay, can everybody else hear? Can I have a few messages just to confirm that? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah that yes. looks good. And lots yes. of thanks to Barry as well. Bit of a robot sound. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll try to speak with a slightly more human voice. Um, <laughs> excellent. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to um, tell you about now in the next few minutes is our experience of crowdfunding, uh, which has been really interesting, actually. And um, there's a note flying around the page. Is that you, Dennis? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, and so it's been very interesting because um, the re – I mean – I've been aware of crowdfunding for some years now, uh, like Kickstarter and everything, and for some time was wondering about how this could work uh, for our Captainurian. And then what really triggered it for me was when earlier this year, um, an organization that I used to work for called Solar Aid, um, when I was there, we developed a product called a gravity lamp with a product design company, which is a lamp that works without any batteries and without any solar power. You just hook on a weight and it pulls it down. And I saw that earlier this year, um, the, the, the design company had tried to raise more money to take this forward and had on Indiegogo asked for $50,000 and had ended up raising just under $400,000. So it'd been really, really successful. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe it's now time to try and apply this to um, uh, the rare disease that we're working on, which is Alcaptonaria. So first of all, what I'm going to do in this presentation is explain to you a little bit about Alcaptonaria. because I think it will be useful uh, for you to, um, to know uh, a little bit about that. So you'll then understand a bit more about what about our campaign and how we've done it. Okay. So um, this is AKU. This is how it affects patients. Both my children um, have got AKU, and we diagnosed them very shortly after birth because their urine was going black. And you can see here, this is what we call the diagnostic tetrad. So in the top left, you have the black urine. And then you have the kind of the, the, the blue-black ears, so the black spots in the eyes, 
and the really kind of uh, painful thing, which is in the bottom right, um, the black bone. And really, it's the kind of carpeting and bone that goes black. Um, and it affects also the spine and the kidneys and the prostate and the heart valves, which calcify. Okay. Um, so it's a degenerative disease. Uh, it's a monogenic disease, so a single gene leading to an enzyme deficiency. And this then, as you can see in the next picture, um, this is um, what the tyrosine metabolic pathway. And you have different um, um, rare dis genetic diseases at different stages of the toxinial Um You have at the bottom tyrosinemia type 1. And our captainuria, which leads to this um, increase in this acid that you can see there in the red um, square, homogenesic acid, the red squat triangle, um, triangle rectangle, we'll get there. And um, that then, um, then binds to cartilage and bone. And above that, you can see nitisinone, which is an enzyme inhibitor, which is the drug that we are testing and that we're raising funds for for the clinical trials which is currently used for the treatment of tyrosinemia type 1 and which we want to use for the treatment of our captainuria because it stops the buildup of this acid and hence prevents the disease if given early enough in life. Okay. Um, so we've created a global patient movement. We have AKU societies now around the world which are independent patient-led societies in different countries. So we don't have an overarching federation. They're all independent. And we did a big um, patient um, identification campaign around the world to identify all these different patients with hotspots in places like India and Slovakia and Jordan and Qatar, etc. And this is the treatment we're crowdfunding for, a nitisinone, um, you know, as I was saying earlier on, which is the enzyme inhibitor. And it reduces the homogenesic acid by 95%. So biochemically, is very good. In the animal model, works absolute wonders. But the difficulty is proving this in a human trial over long enough um, because obviously the disease takes time uh, to develop. But as you can see, the drug is very promising. This is the urine of someone treated with our captainuria. And as you can see, the urine basically clears, okay? uh, treated with nitisinone. So now a bit about the campaign. Well, what we did is earlier this year, we hired um, the, 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 the assistants or the, the free pro bono assistants of five students from the London School of Economics who were seeking to do a project and we asked them to do a project on crowdfunding for rare diseases, particularly for alcaptonuria. So they went away. They did all the literature um, um, search and everything. They also looked at different platforms. They interviewed people. They did a whole bunch of research. And um, without, we, we, you know, from that came a series of recommendations, which we then used um, for our um, crowdfunding campaign. And the first was a recommendation on the platform. So they looked at a whole bunch of platforms, okay, um, and they recommended to us to use Indiegogo because they say this was probably the one with the best functionality. Um, the fact that you can also keep what you raise, you don't have to necessarily hit a target, is good. Um, and it's also very well known, you know, etc. So that's the one that we went for. And then they gave us advice on um, the, the video and the perks and all these different things. So this is our campaign. If you click on that, it should lead you to the, um, the, um, the page on the Indiegogo uh, website. And so what we did, and what seems to be very important with crowdfunding, is um, before you actually launch the campaign, you need to do a lot of work, not just preparing it, but also preparing your key contacts about it. Now, I actually think that at last with crowdfunding, we have a way of raising funds from the public, um, which we didn't have previously for kind of lost and abandoned causes like rare orphan diseases. So if you go around any of the crowdfunding websites like Indiegogo, you'll see that, yes, there are lots of companies raising funds, which is great because people get products in return. Um, but also you get um, a lot of kind of causes like people trying to raise funds for a wheelchair, for their, um, for their child, or they'll be trying to raise funds, you know, to, to, for chemotherapy or whatever. So things that otherwise people would have never donated to. Because until now, the whole fundraising sector was really completely monopolized by the huge um, charities, you know, the Oxfams and the, the cancer researchers, which are doing excellent work. But because they had millions or tens or hundreds of millions of pounds in their marketing budgets, basically crowded out all the others. And we were left to do things like sponsored runs and all that to kind of raise a bit of money here and there, and otherwise to rely on government funding and a few trusts and foundations. So what crowdfunding has done, it's not exactly a kind of a magic bullet, but it actually has opened up a way of raising funds from people that you wouldn't have known of previously 
um, in a much more effective way because it seems that with crowdfunding we actually have an advantage because crowdfunding is a lot about the personal message and if people can really feel in touch with you as a person with the issue that you're crowdfunding for then it's more likely that they will give money towards that so the personal appeal really seems to work well and that's why for our crowdfunding campaign um, we went with kind of my personal appeal with the children and all that kind of stuff to try and raise funds okay so that's the first thing now the next thing is you have to have a very strong message and this is where working as a team really helps so one of our team um, hannah who's our clinical trials coordinator came up with the idea of having in very stark black and white this help us cure black bone disease. And um, you know, when she presented with the idea, immediately everyone thought, wow, this is a really strong message. And so what we've managed to do with this um, is encourage people to take pictures of themselves with this in, you know, all over the world and all that and send it in. Um, and then also it's then helped a lot with our PR and media campaign. So you really need a kind of a really strong message. Um, to go behind your crowdfunding. And I would say that's, that's very important. Um, so that's the second thing. Then the third thing is to make sure that everything is, um, you know, you start telling all your friends and family around two or three weeks in advance. So what we started doing, we launched our campaign on 1st of September and August, which is generally a quiet month. We spent a lot of the time there um, emailing friends and family and telling them we're launching on 1st of September. Please, can you donate on the first day? However much you donate is good, you know, small, big, whatever, because you want from the first day that your thing goes live, that money starts to appear on there. What we also did, and this was Jenny, our um, one of our staff who works in online communities, um, was doing, but which you can do yourself with volunteers or whatever, is uh, we use something called a thunderclap, um, where what you do in the weeks preceding the launch of your campaign is you get as many people as possible to register with Thunderclap for your campaign. And then at a specific time on a specific date, Thunderclap will send a message and a link through everybody's different social media networks. And with that, we raised around, uh, we, we reached around 74,000 people. Okay, so that's a good way to actually start the campaign. Um, so this is, you know, this is a patient, um, Anne Kerrigan, you know, saying help us cure black bone disease. And we could retweet that and put it on Facebook and Indiegogo. This is um, someone with AKU in India um, who is the head of the Tamil Nadu Gypsy Society because the Roma community in India has got thousands of um, AKU patients due to consanguinity. Um, and this is um, the kind of leading professor in our whole consortium, Professor Ranganath, um, you know, again, um, um, kind of promoting uh, the campaign. And this is the AKU Society team. Um, so a bit about Indiegogo. So, you know, when you go to the Indiegogo thing, you'll see um, it's very simple, you know, and very simple to update and very simple also to load your campaign. The great thing about it is that, you know, anybody can launch a campaign on it, whether you're a non-profit, a for-profit or an individual, um, you know, all can, um, can do it and you upload it. And then when you're ready to go, you hit go. Now, one of the things we did is we also reached out to the Indiegogo team and a guy called Garrett there who was very helpful, who went over our campaign, who advised us and all that kind of stuff. And that's good because you want to make contact with whoever is running the platform that you're working on. Um, so we launched and yes, the, the first 10 days are very busy. We raised quite a bit of money, around 20 or 30 percent. So the, the one thing actually is about the target. Um, and this is something I'll come back to. But basically what we did was... Um, we set ourselves a high target of $98,000 and then did the video. And then actually after that thought, well, that's probably a bit too high. Um, and so what we did was uh, we tried to then overdub the video with a $25,000 target. And that didn't work. So in the end, we thought, actually, we do need $98,000. We really do. So let's just aim for um, a high target. In retrospect, I would probably have gone for a target of maybe around 40000 or something. Um, a target that would have been easier to achieve on a number of reasons. One is um, after the campaign, it looks better. So um, there's, um, sorry, just got um, just got distracted. Um, so um, yeah, afterwards it looks better if you've actually exceeded the target. But also um, what I wasn't aware of, uh, at least not fully, was the fact that um, the, the, the fees change uh, with Indiegogo, whether you hit your target or not. So if you don't hit your target, um, they charge a fee of 9% plus 3% credit card, which is 12%. But if you do hit your target, they charge 4% plus 3% credit card. So, you know, when you shop around the platforms, 
um, you need to think also about the fees that the different platforms will charge. Okay, so that that's something there. Um, but we've just today crossed the 50% limit, so we've just crossed uh, $49,000, okay, which we're pleased about, which is money that we didn't have previously, so we're very pleased with that. Um, so these are the different pages, then there's an update page, and this is very important, you should be sending updates to your um, donors um, several times a week. When you send an update, it automatically sends it to everybody um, who's donated, and your, donate, don donate, uh, your update should be personal, so what we've done our team here have set a schedule of updates. So we've had updates from patients, from scientists, um, from fundraisers, et cetera, to kind of keep the engagement going. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to spam people either. So you don't want them, you know, like, you know, several times a day. And then there's a comments page, which you can see there. And there, anybody who donates can then just send little comments. And that's good, makes it look busy. Now, Indiegogo have something that they call a go-go factor. Um, which they say is an algorithm which calculates, you know, how much effort you're putting into the campaign and how busy it is. And then based on that, they will then look at how to promote it through their own um, kind of resources. So after a certain time, when we hit around 30% of our target and we had a lot of engagement, um, it was then appeared on the front page of the Indiegogo website, which was good. But the really good thing is when they actually put it in their newsletter. And that then led to probably around, you know, a few hundred donors actually giving money um, but this was small amounts generally between you know five dollars and maybe eighty dollars whilst what we got from friends of family uh, sometimes could be much higher so you know we had some friends who donated you know one thousand five hundred dollars three thousand dollars etc so when it starts to reach the crowd uh, the people you don't know what then seems to happen from our experience is that you get loads of small donations which obviously are good and you're building your donor base um, but which for us, you know, we kind of would have hoped for um, probably for some bigger donations. Okay. But that's our experience there. Okay. Um, and then you get the funders. So as you can see there, um, when we put this presentation together two days ago, we had 552 funders, which is good. Around half of those are people that we don't know, um, you know, and some people give anonymously. Um, but then also what happens is that when you go into the back end of the system, you get a fulfillment area, which gives you everybody's emails, everything, um, what they've requested as perks and all that, and which means that um, you can then keep the database of donors um, for kind of future appeals. And then you have a gallery, and that's where you put things like videos and photos. And it's good to keep that busy. You know, you want to update it, you know, several times, nearly a, potentially every day or several times a week or whatever. Uh, with videos and all that, so that people can go there and it all looks really busy. Okay. So the implementation, um, so a few do's and don'ts. Uh, well, remember to prepare and plan the, um, the campaign carefully. So as Barry was saying, you don't just launch it and sit there, nothing will happen. It's a lot of hard work. And a few weeks ago, I met the guys from uh, the Lao um, Syndrome uh, group who'd done their um, crowdfunding. And um, actually, it was really good to speak to them because they really, um, they, they really taught me a lot about how they did it and why they were so successful. And they really said that it is a marathon. You know, it's a lot of work. You have to be ready to unashamedly go out, contact people, ask them to donate, ask them to tell their friends. You have to also think about all your offline work. You know, so um, the team here produced little business cards saying cure black bone disease. Um, you have to be ready also to encourage people to give, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so have a look at what the Lao team did, because I think they did really good work in a very difficult environment. And particularly, they worked in an environment in Spain. From what they told me, it's not um, an environment where people are used to, um, um, to a lot of giving to charity and particularly not to online giving. Whilst in the UK and particularly in the US, there is more of a kind of uh, culture of donation and there's more of a culture of using um, 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 you know, um, online for, for giving. So I think what they achieved is really quite spectacular. Um, and then after that, yes, contact your friends and all that kind of stuff beforehand and make the video strong and short. So ours is around two and a half minutes. If we had to redo it, I'd probably do it shorter, maybe just 90 seconds, maybe 100 seconds maximum. Um, you know, I would also, you know, be very, um, when you do your video, um, you know, it doesn't have to be really smooth and polished. You don't want it to look too amateur, but you don't want it to look too professional either, because otherwise it'll look like you don't actually need the money. And you need to make it personal, but you need the backing of a good team. And it doesn't have to be paid staff. If you don't have any paid staff, it needs to be just volunteers, your trustees, and all that kind of stuff. People 
who will um, really um, support your campaign. And you need to have them appear at the bottom of the Indiegogo page where it says team and really try and get their photos in there. You know, a lot of people don't put their photos, but make sure the photos are in there. It makes it much more personal. And then the perks. So the perks are interesting. And Barry um, talked about this. And um, so whilst if you're a company, you can offer in exchange, say, you know, the video game you're producing or a watch or whatever, sunglasses or whatever your company's producing. Um, for a charity, it's obviously going to be, um, you don't want to be produce, um, offering to people anything too significant uh, because otherwise they're going to be like, well, you know, why are you spending all your money on giving back perks, you know? So you need little kind of tokens. So what we had was, um, um, you know, a kind of scale of perks going from just your name on our website um, all the way to a visit to our labs. And that's the big perk. And if people, two people have claimed for that, um, they will have to pay for all their travel um, to the UK. And we will then, you know, um, get them to the labs and spend a day or two in the labs. Okay. Um, so that won't really cost us uh, much money at all. But it's a really nice perk because it means that your most... Um, um, means that your most committed people will actually then start to have a real personal kind of link to that, particularly if it's people who haven't um, met the, the, your team before. And then you have a whole bunch in between. Um, one of the team here, um, Hannah, suggested, because I've just started using some fancy new music software um, called Ableton Live, and she said, well, why don't you actually just make little tunes for people? And it was like, yeah, okay, why not? And that's been really actually quite a successful perk, particularly from friends and family um, who've asked for that. But also people, you know, we're offering mugs, we're offering T-shirts, we're offering wristbands, all that kind of stuff. And so um, um, the, the, the thing when you do these perks, remember also when you calculate um, the, the price of the perk to, um, bring, to, to also include the price of the actual perk. So, for instance, um, you know, our mug is um, a perk, I think, at $111 because, you know, we need to produce the mug and then we need to send it to people, which will probably cost around $10, $15 overall. So you don't want to get caught out, okay, by postage and all that kind of stuff, you know. But it's nice because in the past, while, you know, we were kind of basically begging for funds, in here you're actually offering something in return. And one of the new perks we've put on is actually a chance to chat to one of our scientists and someone just actually bought that perk just uh, about half an hour ago. Um, so that's that. Always thank your donors. So what happens is the emails then start to come through to your account and it can get very busy and I always try and answer the donor immediately. Um, as soon as I get it. So, for instance, on a really busy day where you might be having up to 100 uh, people giving, well, you're basically spending your time kind of answering them. But that's really important. You need to answer generally just with one or two lines, you know, um, and all that, which go, go, go in. Okay. Um, so choose your platform carefully. Um, as Barry was saying, you know, you need to get a good proportion. Uh, we found 35%, anything about 20%. And then the media coverage. And um, so we have a PR company called Tudor Riley who specialise in health, who give us pro bono free support, and they helped us uh, with Oliver here, who's our head of projects, to write a press release, and that was then sent out, and that started to generate, you know, surprising amount of interest. I was really surprised, because in the past, it's been quite difficult to get press interest. And then Indiegogo also asked their PR agency, a company called Cherish, also to help us, and so we got a number of articles in the press, uh, the Daily Mail, uh, the Sunday Express, the Telegraph, um, the Mail Online, and there, you know, it was pretty good coverage overall. As always, working with the press is, um, you know, kind of a bit like playing with fire, particularly because they was my children. And so my, um, you know, I had to speak to my kids and say, well, you know, um, they want to publish photos. You know, uh, do you agree with that? And the children said, actually, we only want photos of when we were very small. That way people can't recognize us at school and all that. So you need to really be aware of all those things. And then, obviously, the press will tend to sensationalize stuff. So we had kind of articles which were, you know, like in some of the press, which were rather on the sensationalist side. But generally, you know, generally, I think it was um, helpful. And, and the journalists were, were very good, you know, very good and very kind and supportive and stuff. Um, but the problem we had was that a lot of the articles failed to include the link to the Indiegogo campaign. So it was a bit of a lost opportunity. And the only article that did, which was the one from the Mail Online, um, generated several thousand dollars worth of donations um, over two days. You know, So it's worth insisting that they put the link in. Um, what we probably didn't do, what I probably didn't do, was push enough um, the fact that this was really about the fundraising. Um, you know, so um, I, I should have probably, looking back, and if there are any more press campaigns, um, say right from the start that this is all about fundraising for us and here's the link and everything. So unashamedly promote it, you know, um, and don't get too led by um, the media themselves. Um, ask your patient supporters to promote it. Like we've had a family in Canada who've been just amazing. The parents have just been 
promoting it, and I've brought in you know thousands of dollars worth of donations. Uh, use social media, so your Twitter, your Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Email people directly. That's very important. Don't just send out a mass email to everybody. Um, email, particularly people you know well, email them directly. You know, dear Bob, dear Harry, dear Jill, whatever. Please, can you donate to the campaign, etc. It takes a lot of time. I've spent literally hours and whole weekends just emailing people and making sure that the message, the email is really tailored to them. You know, how are you? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then to the people you don't know very well, then you can send out a mass email and everything. But you need to email people directly because that is what will really motivate people and obviously frequent updates and comments. OK, um, so again, you know, this is our campaign. Um, go there. You know, if you want to donate, obviously, we'd be really happy for you to do that. We've just reached 50 percent. We've got nine days left. And what we've done also is create a whole bunch of milestones um, around the campaign. So, for instance, I'm in the middle of the campaign. Um, we had an award. Uh, we won an award with an American group called the Global Genes Project. And we won this for Developer Cure, which is the consortium um, which is um, doing um, all the, the clinical trials, the phase two and phase three for this drug, nitisinone. So one of our top professor, Professor Jim Gallagher, went to California on 21st of September to, to receive the award with one of our patients in the US and everything. And that was a really good milestone, you know, to kind of have in the middle of the Indiegogo campaign. Also, we launched the AKU site in India on the same day. So that was another great opportunity. And last Saturday, we um, our, the, the, the patients in Slovakia launched the AKU site in Slovakia. So we had a whole series of events. And then the campaign actually ends um, on Thursday in a week's time, which is when we have our big patient meeting in Liverpool and our big annual scientific meeting in Liverpool. So it's nice to actually fit it in with a whole range of events to kind of create a buzz and all that. The length of the campaign, 47 days. At one point, we thought of actually just doing it for three weeks, but then Indiegogo told us actually generally good campaigns last around 45 to 47, 48 days. Um, I would say I wouldn't do longer than that. It's a really tiring thing. To be honest, I'll be glad when it's over. You know, you don't want to be constantly harassing people to give money and stuff like that. It takes a lot of energy out of the team and stuff and what we're doing. Um, so, you know, you want to have a good, clear target. But then after that, we're thinking of potentially a follow on campaign, you know, whether we still need to raise funds, etc. You know. So that's it, really. But my, my advice to you is just do it. It is really worth it. You have absolutely nothing to lose. Um, and the great thing is, if you've got a big team of volunteers and all that, you know, you're on to a winner. That's it. OK, th thank you, Nick. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to move to some questions. Um, so, um, Barry, there were there were some concerns about your audio earlier. If that persists, we can move you to web audio and use your microphone's audio if you wish, and I can show you how to do that now. I can't hear you now at all. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, me. We speak. No, to I'm me? talking to Barry. All right, Barry. I can't hear you now at all, Barry. Do you see? There's um, uh, an icon on the top of your page. Um, that's it's a microphone icon or a telephone icon. Could you perhaps click on that? Right, with some very interesting questions coming in. Um, okay, I should be on my yes. now. Yes, okay, you're, you're back, you're back. Okay, look, I, rather than messing with anything, if people have problems hearing Barry, I can hear him quite well, so I'm happy to repeat any of the questions uh, for any of, any of you. So listen, there's a couple of um, um, interesting questions that have come in, which we, will, um, which we will get to. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind, that I'd like to put to both of you. Um, the first one is really, I mean, how, how important is a video? Is, is it really vital? Because it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah, video is absolutely essential for, mo for most campaigns. Um, there, there, are, there, there are rare exceptions, but, you know, as Nick said, the personal really matters and people want to see generally the people that they're working with on this. So um, it doesn't have to be flash, it doesn't have to be, um, uh, you know, professionally made or, 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 or 
expensive, just so long as it isn't so bad quality that it puts people off. But um, you know, it, it's really important. To, you know, if you can uh, having a video is, is is a big plus. You you potentially handicap yourself quite a lot if you if you flunk the video. Um, and it, and it's worth putting some time and effort into it. Uh, both into you know reinforce the message, get the messages clear, get them right so that you know people outside your immediate circle can understand them and engage with them, and get them clearly across across in the video. It's so important. Um, right. The, the the other thing I'll say about the video is there is an optimum length for a video. Three minutes is a minute and a bit too long. Okay, so it's tempting to say I can't get it all into the time. You should aim for one minute and forty seconds. <laughs> that's okay. from experience. Wow. That's what works really well. Any anything, the longer it gets after that, you've got you're into diminishing returns. Okay, so that's um, the, the, to wrap up there. Barry is just saying that a video is really important. It doesn't have to be pro, but you don't want to be putting people off. And that one minute forty seconds is is an ideal uh, time. Now, I mean, I'm conscious. There's a lot of questions coming in, but the one thing that I'm conscious of is I think that many of our participants here are first timers uh, coming to crowdfunding for the very first time. Maybe have heard about it, seen some of the projects, but are maybe considering doing this into the future. Could you just clear up there, Nick? I mean, about the whole idea between the flexible funding and the target-driven funding, because or I don't know even if that's what it's called, because there is a type of project where if you don't reach the target, you don't get the money, which isn't what you did. You did a flexible uh, project. Could you just clarify for people what that is, the, the difference between the two types of, 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 of targets so that people can be aware of what they're, they're getting into? Sure, okay. Um, but first of all, actually, just to add a bit on the video thing and why it's so important, um, as Barry was saying, it makes it very personal and people find it much easier than just reading text. But secondly, also, it's very easy to put together a video. You know, I mean, you can just like use it from your phone or whatever, some video editing software, and you can get something that already looks pretty good. So it should not, you know, it's better than um, not having anything. That's one thing for sure. And if you look at Indiegogo statistics, so one of the things that we did was actually go onto the Indiegogo website and they have a whole kind of, um, you know, um, guide for how to do a campaign read it you know it'll take you maybe an hour to read through but it's got loads of brilliant tips and make sure you read it before you actually start designing your campaign it's a download it's a pdf on there and it's really worth it so that's the first thing now um the thing on flexible versus fixed um so yeah this is interesting so a lot of the original crowdfunding platforms um basically said um, you set a target so let's say you know ten thousand dollars if you don't reach that target you get nothing if you reach it and exceed it you keep what you get what you've raised and so basically, there was an example of that recently with the guys who wanted to launch a smartphone with an open source software called Ubuntu. And they had set themselves, I think, a target at something like 30 million or whatever. And they only got to around 20 million, which is still huge. But because they didn't reach their target, they got absolutely nothing. OK, and that's pretty gutting. Now, the reason for that is um, it then creates much more of a sense of urgency. You know, like if we don't get this, we really need it because otherwise, you know, we're not going to get any money. Now, Indiegogo also offer the, what they call flexible, which is mean you keep what you raise. So, you know, we've set ourselves a target of 98,000. At the moment, we're just under 50,000. Um, say we raise, I don't know, 55, 60,000 by um, the, the time our campaign ends, we will keep all that 60,000, even though we haven't raised 98,000. However, there is a penalty, and that penalty is a higher fee, which is 9% of what we've raised rather than 4% if we hit the target. So you have to be very careful, and that's why looking back, I would have probably um, um, set a lower target of around, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40,000, which we'd have hit, obviously, much more easily. And that would have then made it look more successful, um, even though we'd have probably raised the same. And also we'd have had a lower fee. So that's the fixed versus flexible. So it's better to have, you know, um, um, a lower target that you exceed than a higher target that you don't quite get. Right. Yeah. What advice? I mean, that's a very important question. Being realistic when you're setting your target and when you're setting the time frame, you gave us some indications about the 45 days, 47 days. You've said that in retrospect, you may have chosen a lower, a lower target. Um, Barry, from having seen many different kinds of campaigns, how would a first timer coming to crowdfunding, how should they go about setting a target that's realistic for them? Yeah, I think what Nick said is really, is really good and interesting. Um, go for achievable. 
Um, go, go for something that, you know, particularly the first time, build your confidence, go for something you can achieve. So um, don't forget, and it, it's something that is, you need to keep at the front of your mind because um, it's not the usual way of thinking. Don't forget you can get more. So let's talk about stretch targets. So Nick might, you know, in uh, another time decide to go for 30,000 with a stretch target at 60, another at 70, and another at 80, where, where he would be saying, look, we need, to get, we need to get to 30, but if we get to 60, we can do all of this. And if we get to 70, we can do so much more. So don't forget that you can exceed targets. So, so um, think of it perhaps as an internal target and an external target. So, so the external target is 30. Uh, we know we can get that. You know, we, we, we know we've got enough support to reach there, but, you know, we've got some stretch targets and what we really want to do, what the team is going for is 60, 70 or 80 or, or, or whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, in terms of the target, be, be realistic. Um, you know, if you absolutely need a figure, 50,000 or whatever it is, in order for the thing to fly, then you know, you've got to be realistic about that and, and maybe you want to be on um, all or nothing. Um, uh, the, the advantage of the, the flexible deal is, you know, if it's if it's something much more about the more that we raise, the more people we can get treated or whatever, it, it might it might fit better there. But right. the other thing to just bear in mind is it's not a one off journey. So it's, you know, you do want to succeed the first time. It will help and, and build your community and give you confidence. But you will be building your community anyway, and you can go again. Right. Um, just on that topic, I mean, are there any risks um, associated with setting up the uh, campaign? I mean, are, are you a risk, is there a risk of you losing money because of setup fees or anything like that? Uh, just a quick a question around that. Not, not really, not in the kind of platforms that we're really talking about here with rewards and donations. Um, some okay. of the equity crowdfunding platforms have got fees and so on built in. Um, uh, you can avoid those anyway. Some of the better ones don't. Um, but, but usually what you're risking is time and money. I suppose the other, the other thing that you, you, know, you do have to think about is if you got it disastrously wrong, um, you know, and did something horrible on social media that could be brand damage, but that's the, you know, th that's just in the nature of communications and social media. So, so, so you know, that's not particular to, to crowdfunding, but uh, okay. you know, um, yeah, yeah okay, on. yeah, thank you. Now, um, I've noticed on the crowdfunding center that there are at least you list over 150 platforms, uh, if I'm right which is quite a, a staggering array of, of platforms to choose from. Um, I mean, Indiegogo, Kickstarter are the ones we always hear about. Are there others that we should be considering uh, coming from perhaps the, the rare disease um, patient group movement? Yeah, the, the, um, if, you, if you go and look, uh, the, there are a smaller number um, from the UK. We think there's, you know, pushing towards somewhere between 800 and 1,000 platforms overall worldwide uh, it's growing just at an amazing rate for good reasons there's something um you know approaching 100 platforms in the uk which is where we're kind of focused at the moment the the, the notable ones um are people like bloom vc um who we know well are very good in terms of supporting and helping people um, and you know uh, nick's done extraordinarily well to engage with indiegogo um, you know, they're very big, they're American, um, uh, and he's done, done very well to get their attention. It's usually really quite difficult with the bigger ones. Uh, one of the advantages of people like Bloom, being UK based, being newer, um, the, the, you know, the, the, there's a very caring ethos. There's people like Sponsor Craft, um, uh, and uh, if, you, if you just go and do a quick search on, um, on the crowdfunding centre, if you select UK platforms, you'll, you'll see, and you'll soon get a feel for uh, the good ones and what works. Okay. 
Uh, there was a question there relevant to your comment on risk, um, which I picked up on as well, which is uh, what money is in risk if there are no fees? Because you did say about time and money, but I'm sure is it, you mean staff time in the, the sense of the money. that uh, Was that what you meant in, in, in terms of, of, of any money that could be at risk? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. It's really, it's your time and effort and, um, right. you know, yeah. Right. Um, so a question about, I mean, as you... What kind of indicators should you be measuring from the start in order to be able to adapt your campaign as, as it moves forward? Okay, um, the, the, the easiest one, ones and the most powerful are the social media. So, you know, um, as I said before, um, crowdfunding is built on social media so um, you know see see what's happening there monitor closely uh, what's happening on Twitter on Facebook you, you know ideally you, you you will have or create a presence in all of those and uh, in, in both of those uh, there's lots of tools around uh, if you can rope someone in if you don't have them already to help you with the social media you know that will have a, a, a big impact uh, Nick mentioned uh, PR and so on. Um, you know, it again can have a huge impact, particularly if you link it to uh, uh, to the social media. So you know, it, it's great if there's a way that when people go, oh right, it's black bone disease. Um, if I go and Google that, you know, can I find it easily? So social so SEO, um, you know, can be really really powerful, important because it's really difficult to get magazines and journalists to to quote your url um you know sometimes they do sometimes they don't when they do it's great but if people can read the article and go do you know what you know as long as, if they can find you more easily um, that, that's really important okay nick do you have anything to add to that in terms of i mean what should you be measuring um from the start you know barry mentioned the social media um, any other kind of key indicators in terms of your reach rate or the, the kind of, those kind of indicators that are, might give you an in indication? I can't hear you, Nick. Um, you'd have to enable your audio. Um, so say if the microphone icon, it's the second icon there on the top of your page. Can you see it? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the key indicator is obviously the donations coming in. You know, the right. money that you're getting, um, and, and 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 that is the, the the key focus. So that's why, for instance, like um, you know, when we got um, all this PR in major newspapers, which in normal times we'd have been delighted about, but there, because there was no link and because that didn't lead to any donations, um, it just felt like a real lost opportunity. So for us, the key indicator is how much money comes in. You know. So, um, but then there's also actually a second key indicator for us, uh, which was um, actually in a way equally important, if not more important, and which from the start we were hoping for, but which we had no idea whether to expect. That was whether our campaign would lead to the identification of any new patients. And we had two. We had one who contacted us a week ago um, after having read um, or I think heard one of the radio interviews on the BBC that we did. Um, said, oh my God, I've got those symptoms, and who's now getting checked to see if they have alcaptonuria. And then a few days ago, we had um, someone whose husband read about um, the campaign in one of the daily papers, and um, she had alcaptonuria, had had six joint replacements, had known about the disease for 20 years, but had never been referred by anybody um, to our um, clinical centre in Liverpool. You know, so just for that, it's a huge success. Even if we hadn't raised a penny. Um, but we'd identified two new people like that, including one who previously was not diagnosed. For us, that would have already been a huge success. Right. Um, I'd like to get to the perks. Oliver asked a question earlier, which I thought is a very good question. Uh, he said, how many people donate for a perk compared to those who donate to just help out? Maybe, Barry, yeah. you could take that. Okay, um, uh, I, I can't give you stats on that, but what I can tell you is that um, the, you know, it's the, it, what you need to be thinking about is the coverage. So, um, 
there's a very very strong um, pull for people to give because they care. Um, so you need you need a you know something that people can put a small amount of money into. But there's the, there is a pattern um, that the platforms find is that particularly in this sort of area, um, even when you've got um, you know higher value perks, sometimes people will put money in. Uh, and a significant percentage of people put money in, you know, for a higher value with a perk attached, don't, don't, don't collect the perk. That it wasn't about, it wasn't about that, it wasn't about the money. Um, but strategically what you want to be doing is, is, is giving people the choice and the reason. So, so, you know, give them something to hang on to, you know, uh, give them uh, um, something tangible. Uh, at quite a low level where they can feel yes I did help every time I look at this mug or wear the t-shirt or, or or whatever it is um, you know I can feel uh, I can feel good about that and and, and feel connected so um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean with that. you said that's um, the perks I mean yeah on Dennis go ahead I was just going okay. to say, Nick, that I found your perks very attractive. I, I found the perks that you guys came up with very attractive and, and, and very easy to implement and very, very personable. Um, that was obviously key to, to your campaign. Yeah, I mean, it was um, because it kind of uh, makes it more fun, really. I think that's, that's um, the, the thing, particularly with kind of charity campaigns like ours. I think if you're a business, well, people do really expect something in return, you know. Um, but I think for us, you know, it just makes it much more fun. And I think what Barry was saying about people then feel an emotional connection when they wear the T-shirt or the wristband or drink from the mug is also really important. So he acts as kind of PR after the campaign. But um, the, the key element is to kind of make them slightly quirky. So to have a mix of kind of traditional ones like T-shirts and slightly more quirky ones, you know, which people will kind of find amusing. And, and, and that's where, um, um, you know, again, having a team is really important because we have brainstorm sessions around this, around, well, what could we do? You know, what could we put in? And also the great thing is you can add more perks as your campaign progresses, you know? So, I mean, you don't want like 50 perks. You don't want just five, but around 10 is generally a good idea. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Ben McKendrick. Yes. Sorry. Yes, Barry. I was say the creativity point is a really good one. Uh, do get really creative with it because it's amazing what you can come up with. Uh, if you've got, you know, people attached to you that, um, you know, that can do a little video or, 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 or you know, offer something or, or whatever, that would be very attractive. And it might not, might not be a sled. It might be, as we said before, an opportunity to meet a real scientist, you know, right. or, or, or whatever. But get, get, get creative. Yeah. We have a good question from Ben McKendrick from Myeloma UK. I think this is an excellent question, asking about the possibility to integrate crowdfunding into the other activities of a patient group or an advocacy group. So in conjunction with a crowdfunding campaign to integrate a message or integrate it with an advocacy message, an awareness message or, or fundraising generally. How do you, have you seen that kind of integration take place, Barry? Or what, do you have any opinion on that, Nick? Um, there's not a lot of it happened so far, but we we know there's a lot um, being planned and you know going on um, going forward in terms of uh, organisations integrating crowdfunding into what we do. So we're going to see more and more of that, and it's a smart thing to be thinking about and a smart thing to be doing. But you know um, you're going to need to kind of be thinking about your own organisation, how it works. It's going to work with your community, but yeah, kind of integrating it. You know, the, the, the bits of tech that helps with that. Most of the platforms will give you a widget that you can put on your uh, on your on your website. Increasingly, crowdfunding technology will be um, genericized, so you'll be able to have your own crowdfunding platform. Um, in fact, you can already. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing that if that works for your community, or you'll be able to run crowdfunding campaigns from within your own web presence. So th there's going to be all sorts of new um, innovations in that sort of area, but we're just kind of be beginning on them now, I think. Right, right. No, yes. I mean, yes, Nick. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, what Ben has said there is key because, funnily enough, whilst we kind of, you know, we've, we've known from the start that this would be a good way of raising awareness, um, but actually it's during the course of the campaign that we realised how important it is to kind of create a very coordinated one that has the advocacy messages and everything. So actually it's last, um, when was it, earlier this week, we had a session uh, as the team and also the communications expert where we looked at um, coming out of this campaign, what can we actually do as a long-term communications and marketing campaign? So I think the more all this can be integrated, the better, because actually it works as a really good way of having um, a kind of time period where you're really actively pushing out your message as well as trying to raise funds. Yeah. So, I mean, on crowdfunding, I mean, I've seen everything, all sorts of quacky projects, you know, from people wanting to fly a plane across the sky with a message to, you know, people wanting to fundraise for their own personal uses. Of, you know, I mean, we've seen, it's, it's a whole world, obviously, crowdfunding. But from our perspective, I'd like to get a feel for what kind of projects work best. I mean, I'm seeing now the growth of a kind of a call for specific scientific research projects in some areas. There's the idea of maybe social projects in, in, in other ways that work well, or in your case, Nick, the idea of, of paying or funding a travel to a clinical trial, or you know, I see groups fundraising to, for, for a video, for awareness. I mean, is there a sense of, of a, a specific kind of project that works, or is it really down to, it has to be personal, it has to, to really kind of grab at the heartstrings, or, or, or you know, um, because I can see a lot of groups maybe wanting to initiate some projects that could kickstart some research in, the, in their rare disease for which there is very little research, as was the case for Loa syndrome, which you know, managed to pay for a, a research position to initiate some research. Yeah, there, there, are, um, you know, there, there are easier um, types of projects and harder ones. Anything that's visual uh, it makes it easier. Anything that, as you say, tugs at the heartstring, has an emotional pull, um, can be very strong. Um, you know, uh, one of the keys is the, the ability to communicate what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and the difference it's going to make. So if that's relatively easy to communicate, um, then, you know, that, that's, that, that's going to be, you know, that's going to help a lot. If not, you know, usually you can overcome these things, but it might take more work and more, more sort of strategic thinking on, on the marketing side. Um, there, there's lots being done um, in, in, in the social enterprise space. Interestingly, the, the RSA in the UK, the Royal Society of the Arts, have got a big program that we're helping them with at the moment, where they're um, empowering lots of uh, budding social entrepreneurs and social enterprises. Um, and and that's, that's the sort of that might be something that you know we can help link, link into. We're also um, looking at putting together a UK conference. Maybe it should be wider. I don't know. On 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 exactly this sort of area, biomedicine, uh, health, uh, and related. So I'd be interested to have feedback, by the way, from you and from participants on on whether you'd find that useful, um, because it's something we are thinking about. Know, doing in the new year. Okay, thanks, Barry. Now I'm conscious that Nick has to leave us, um, and, and and thanks for the time that he's been able to give us this evening. So, Nick, as you said, there's I think five or six, six or seven days left in your in your campaign. I mean, you've as you say broken the 50% barrier. What do you hope for from the next couple of days? And are there any kind of take-home messages apart from what you've shared that you'd like to to share with us this evening before you go? Yeah, well, what we really like to see is obviously a final push that leads to a significant surge in donations um, that helps us reach our target. I mean, apparently our um, the PR agency was speaking to Indiegogo um, like last week, and they thought we could still make it. Now, you know, we'll see, and we're going to st we're starting to do a big push. So the idea that the team had here, which has started to happen, is for every single day, you know, countdown from day ten. I think today we were on day eight or seven. Um, eight it was today, um, there'll be a different fact, you know, so for instance, um, day three will be the fact that AKU is on chromosome three today, day eight was the fact that the guy who identified our captain Nuria 
um, did his big lecture announcing it in um, 1908. You know, all that kind of stuff. And we're gonna, I'm going to do a big push from tomorrow again to all my contacts and friends and all that to try and get them to donate. Uh, we're speaking again to the Indiegogo's PR agency tomorrow to follow up some um, um, some potential um, with some TV who contacted us early this week about doing something on the news and stuff. So, you know, we're doing a big push. And who knows, we might reach our target, we might not, you know. Um, so, so that's the key thing. It's kind of doing a big thing at the end. Um, a couple of other things. One is, um, I think, Dennis, you've got out the presentation that the LSC guys did, didn't, don't you? Yes, I do. And I, we, uh, just for everybody's um, attention, I'll share all of the presentations uh, on the link that I just presented there earlier. So including that presentation, which was very good. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is um, the research that the LSC team did on crowdfunding for rare diseases, particularly for AKU, but which is applicable to any kind of rare disease. So, you know, use all the information as much as you can. Um, it's quite dense and there's a lot of stuff in there. So it's, it's really worth the read. And then the, the last thing was, um, you know, it would be interesting to see what happens as the whole crowdfunding area becomes more crowded. Um, and, um, you know, I think it will become increasingly difficult potentially to actually make your mark through there. Um, and the reason I say that is, um, you know, I, I might be completely wrong, but if you look at other areas, particularly self-publishing, so, you know, um, about three years ago, Amazon launched their whole Kindle Direct publishing platform. And the first authors who got on there um, managed to make, uh, are still making an absolute fortune in sales because they built their brand and stuff. But unfortunately now, the Amazon Kindle platform is just completely swamped with so many authors selling their stuff that it becomes you know, self-publishing, that it's very difficult to actually make your mark through that. Now, I don't know whether crowdfunding will be the same. We've now got thousands of platforms. I suspect it will be kind of different because at the beginning, you will have all your friends and family and all that really pushing it. So you'll be able to hopefully reach that critical mass. And also because these people, there they won't be as much competition. So, you know, one author who writes a thriller is in direct competition with another author who writes a thriller. But one rare disease is not necessarily in competition with another one because what you're starting off is all your friends, your family, and your networks who are supporting you, you know. And so that's the key thing. So it will be interesting to see whether it gets harder or it actually might get easier as more and more people start to understand the concepts of crowdfunding and all that. So it's definitely a space to watch and to see what then happens. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, what Nick just said about the potential for overcrowding? Um, I mean, I, I would have thought that, you know, that there's always the possibility possibility to engage uh, 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 an even growing network given the m amount of million people that we are on the human planet with access now to the internet and so on through crowdfunding do you think that there's the danger of overcrowding in the in the in, in any time soon not anytime soon um you know i was reading actually because of a conversation that we had dennis um just looking back on um the article a few years ago from you know about the long tail um, how yes. you know most things are targeted on on the mass market, but there's this hugely long tail of unmet possibilities and need, and and I think um, that you know th this is one of the real key things for the you know the the um, the power of crowdfunding in in this area is that because you're dealing with a community, it, it's made for communities. It's made for being able to, you know, work with the community and reach out from the community. So, um, you know, uh, maybe ultimately, who knows, but not anytime soon. Okay, that's good news. You know, that's good news for us all. So, listen, I think um, I'm conscious that everyone has spent a sufficient amount of their, their evening with us this evening to learn about this topic. Hopefully, it's the first of, of several more webinars or workshops or ways that we can discuss um, what this is and how it can benefit from us all. And as I think the message I take home from it, yeah, as you said earlier, just just do it. You know, just go and do it because I think we we have a, we have a story to tell. Uh, and so hopefully, if we here at Gerardus and our colleagues like Nick and Barry can come together and kind of pull together some best practices, some experience sharing, that's that's all the better to help us maybe do this this you know better. So I'd like to thank everybody this evening. Um, lots to take away. You can he see the email contacts for both Barry and Nick if you'd like to follow up with them after this. And the presentations will be online at the link that I uh, showed you there earlier, moderators.rareconnect.org. So with that, I'll say good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye.